Nothing. I can show you pictures of this of this space with nothing in it except the, the walls and everything. Uh, and, and so everything that you see here, everything you see when you walk in the suite is new as of 2019. But when you get down to some of the, the infrastructure pipes and things like that, those are maybe from the 1930s and so on. You know, so that's when this property was originally built. So anyway, so uh, given that, uh, we have to be cautious. They have to be cautious because if there's uh, instance, certain kind of uh, insulating materials, if it gets airborne uh, and people inhale it, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. So I imagine the people that are gonna be in doing the work are gonna look like they're gonna be like hazmat suits and stuff like that. The work's gonna be all done in the mobility center. All right, so apparently the problem is material is like falling down on them <laughs> from oh. the pipes up above. Um, and those are, those are uh, plumbing pipes. And so you generally said you don't like to have you know, plumbing lines hit with you know, debris dried debris, I don't care what decade it's from, you don't want dry you know, stuff falling on you, whatever. Uh, and so in this case, it's a little complicated. So, so, so I apologize for that. You'll see that in your mail uh, that I said, uh, we've we got to be out of here by close of business Friday, and uh, back in here first thing Monday morning. So again, apologize if you had plans to come in to do stuff uh, out, of our, out of our control. I tried to push it off till December when we're all out of here, because he's got like six weeks to get it done. He said, no, we got to get it done. So I never know whether that's just baloney, uh, as we say in the, in the Bronx, I don't know what that is. Uh, but the fact is, uh, uh, we had to do it, so no choice. Okay, so we're listening, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at um, speech audiometry, and I wanted to give you again, this, 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 again some of these basic principles that you're going to have to now kind of apply as you start to do the basic test that you're going to do. Uh, principle number one is that uh, if you want to test for detection, you have to use familiar materials. If you want to test for recognition, then you have to test at a level that's audible. So there's a trade-off. So if you're testing to find the least audible amount, uh, the, the least audible uh, value that someone can detect uh, and repeat back speech, whatever the level of the task is, um, that has to be with familiar materials, otherwise there'll be too much variability. So, um, so that's why when we say when you're doing a test for the audibility level for what's the, the least amount of audibility that a, list, that a listener can repeat back words to you if you're defining it as a recognition task. Remember you have this, 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 this cascade, if you will, this continuum of different levels of complexity, uh, if you will, from analytic to synthetic. So again, understanding that most of our interests as audiologists, when we're in the context of what I'm talking about now, it, we're talking about really assessment that's focused on the peripheral auditory system. So outer ear, middle ear, inner ear, auditory nerve, up until uh, connection of the auditory nerve into the brainstem. Now you're gonna have a whole class, uh, AUD 6250 auditory processing disorders, I think that's what it's called, maybe it's called central auditory processing disorders, I don't know what it is exactly. That class is gonna talk a lot about speech testing that now is going to stress the central nervous system uh, part of the auditory system, which is where we leave off, we leave off at the synapse, so to speak, between the, the, um, the eighth nerve and then the, uh, the cochlear nuclei in the brainstem. So once you cross that synapse, once you're now into the cochlear nuclei and you're heading, you're ascending uh, in the auditory system in the central nervous system now, that's where central auditory processing takes over. And there's a lot of uh, tests that, are, that utilize speech stimuli uh, in, uh, in, in that assessment battery. Lots of tests. Um, lots of really interesting tests. Um, so I'll give you a quick example, a little, a little tease for what you're gonna be doing in psychoacoustics. You're gonna be talking about, uh, before you, maybe you already have, where you started to talk about binaural fusion or benefits of binaural hearing. Well, that'll be one of the last major topics you're gonna to do. And so one of the basic ideas of binaural uh, fusion or binaural hearing is that basically what you put in the right ear, what you go in the left ear, is, is compared, contrasted, combined, if you will, in the brainstem. All right, so there's no direct place where the, the, the inner ear and, and the, 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 the peripheral auditory pro, uh, output of, the, of each ear intersect except in the central nervous system. So, so here's the thing, so like one of the tests is basically is that you can put you know, one part of the word in this ear, the other part in this ear, and then your brain hears the whole word. Okay, and when I say part, you can do it, you can divide it up by frequency, you can divide it up by timing, you can divide it up whatever, but the, the, the system combines it. So we have this capacity of binaural fusion. So a lot of the tests of central auditory processing look at deficits, like for example, deficits that, that are in, in, you know, in binaural fusion. So a lot of the psycho, 
the psychoacoustic things that you're going to learn in the coming weeks will have much of their application really in the central auditory test battery. What we're talking about here is the peripheral auditory test battery. And so it gets much more complicated. So when I, when I talk about doing speech testing, I'm thinking of it in, in the context of our, our you know, you know, sort of elementary uh, uh, peripheral test battery. So, so looking for audibility, a threshold for speech, then you have to use materials that uh, are well known to the listener. And again, how do you, uh, how do you, you know, how do you make sure that those are well known words? You could read them to them or have them repeat them back to you, or you're making an assumption, which may or may not be true, that they know these words. So again, as adults, uh, you, you see the word list that we use typically for the, for the word recognition test done for threshold of speech. You can make your own assessment about are those words known to everybody? You know, is, that, is that a fair assumption? But you know, I would always read them to them anyway just to be sure that, that that source of variability is, uh, is taken care of. Remember, your overarching task is to control for variability in the test procedures because you want to have, again, the best possible test results that you're presenting moving forward. They may be data that you're going to make decisions on. They may be data that other people are going to make decisions on. They may be data on which you know, benefits may accrue to the person with it or may be den denied to the person. So there's a lot of important um, uh, implications of the accuracy of our data, but fundamentally it's up to you to control all of the variability so that the data you have is the cleanest possible data. All right, so, so that's the one thing for the testing for speech threshold, familiar materials, make them familiar if, if they're not already. Uh, again, um, you know, the converse side of this is that if you want to find out how well a person you know, is able to recognize words, how well they understand it, remember I said operationally, we're going to define operational here as they can repeat the words back to us, then that level of that assessment has to be presented at an amplitude at which speech is audible. Otherwise, it's an unfair test. Otherwise, you're doing a threshold test. So what we're interested in is if we can present the, the material at a level that's clearly audible to them, then we are interested in what's their uh, recognition ability. Understand that, that one key difference in terms of the data we're collecting is that the speech threshold data is collected in uh, the actual, the, the actual uh, dependent variable is decibels, D-B-H-L, okay? So in that sense, it really is like our pure tone threshold testing because again, what's the, what's the very, what, what are we measuring in, in uh, basic audiometry? D-B-H-L. The data of record are DBHL, that's on a bivariate plot of frequency versus amplitude, that intersection on the audiogram, whatever that may be, that data in DBHL, we want to compare this S, uh, the speech reception threshold data to that. And, and, and we can, because they're, they're both in decibels here and there. And the only difference between DB, um, uh, the only difference between um, using speech material versus using pure tones as the stimulus is that pure, tone, uh, pure tones are discrete. And you can sample particular portions of the, of the spectrum that humans are sensitive to. Uh, and with speech, it's, it's necessarily a broadband stimulus that has lots of frequencies in it continuously varying across frequency. Um, so, so, um, so everything that you do uh, in pure tone testing should be within that broadband of speech energy somewhere. Uh, so um, the operational things then for as uh, much as I said to you, the, the key sort of control of variability, if I was to say, for, um, for the speech threshold test is really the words that you're using. Are they familiar? And again, the other thing that I pointed out to you is um, it's, it's, it's the implication, although it's not exactly accurate, is that the, the materials you're using as tokens, remember, when you present, you do a pure tone test, and, and you're having, you know, and you present a, a stimulus at 10 dB, 500 hertz, a 10 dB. And then you, whatever it is, they hear it, they don't hear it, and then eventually you come back to that 500 hertz again and you present it again. Is there any doubt in your mind that the stimulus that you presented on trial one with 500 hertz at 10 dB is, any, is different from the second time you use that 500 hertz 10 dB? Do you have any fear? Is, that, is there any vulnerability to you at all about the reliability, the reproducibility of that stimulus when you use it multiple times. Is there? No. No, and that's really, really good. 
It would be a problem if it did, because as you're testing from one trial to another and you're trying to establish threshold, I mean, how, how difficult would that be? If that, if that number was, look, was all over the place, okay? And, and I, I can't think of, well, the only, the only circumstance I can sort of think of that where that might be a case, and I don't know the, I don't know the, 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 the data on it, would be as if, and I see now there's a proliferation of portable audiometers that utilize battery power as opposed to line voltage power. That, you know, is it possible? And I don't know, and I'm not an electrical engineer, so I can't, it might be a real simple answer, like, no, of course. Yeah. Uh, that if there's, if, as the battery voltage goes down, as it will, is there gonna now be a reduction in the amplitude or a variability in the amplitude as that's happening? You know, I think it's possible, but I don't, I just, honestly, I don't know. That would be a good doctoral project. You get a bunch of you know, portable audiometers and see at what point do they start to get fritzy? Do they start to go, you know, you know out of control? At what, and, and how do we know that? You know, th does the manufacturer let us know that? Um, you know, we don't have any, the portables we have here, I don't think, uh, have battery powers, but the ones we use for our amp, uh, audiometry class do. And I, students love them because they can take them. They don't have to, you know, they can go different places and test and don't have to worry about power. And that's, that's great. All right, so you all agree with me that if you've got, uh, or you all agree with me at least that the stimulus that, you, that we're going to be using with audiometers is a stable amplitude specific signal. All right? And that's based on calibration and, and based on the fact the equipment is pretty good and all that. And we have a stable power source. You can't make that assumption about SRT. Because the amplitude of each individual word that you are going to be using is going to be variable. Because each one has slightly different vowel structures. And again, there's, a different, there's different amplitudes for different vowels. The complication is also then is that how it's being produced for the listener. If it's produ being produced using a recorded material, now more digitized material that's available um, with like audio, uh, GSI Audio Star Pro, whatever, um, then then that at least you know they can they can control it so that it doesn't exceed certain you know limits. So, it, it's, but if it's you saying the words, you could be all over the place with it. So as I had mentioned to you before, if you're going to be doing monitored live voice SRT materials. That's going to be the single largest variable uh, that you're going to have in any testing that you do as a beginning clinician. And until you get used to saying the words and practicing saying those words so that you have a relative you know, consistency of amplitude by watching the monitor and being able to keep that, you know, not, you know, if you're saying one word and it's all the way over here in like the little green lights and another word here is like all red, solid red, not even blinking. It's like, oh, okay, something's wrong. You know, so that's, that's on, you know, that's not necessarily totally on you. That's also on the vowel construction and the construction of that particular word. So I passed out to you, and I think I also, uh, it's one of the articles uh, that I have here for you on, on a, uh, some people from Central Michigan that years ago did, it, did it, uh, a check on the assumption of the, what we would say, the homogeneity of amplitude of these spondate words and found out that there weren't, that there's some words are hot, some words are cold, and there's words that are really good in between. So the, the, the point of that would be, you know, probably to avoid either extreme words because they're not homogenous relative to their amplitude, but rather use the ones kind of in between. Um, and so that, that again, unless you use a monitored live voice, that's gonna be the major thing that you have to control. All right, uh, that's for that. When we get to now doing word recognition, Again, we do have this monitored live voice versus recorded um, concept. And in many clinics now, uh, if, if there's a, again, uh, more of these you know, audiometers that have the digitized speech on board, will likely adopt and probably should adopt um, the, the, um, the recorded materials because there's gonna be less variability. Um, and again, that's going to be based on your, the clinics that you're going to go to. You still have to have the capacity. You need to be able to deliver this test anyway yourself. Um, uh, so, so you do still have that, you know, that, that individual word effect. Um, but the principal variable that will affect the outcome of the word recognition test is the amplitude that, uh, that you're presenting at, so presentation level. Again, there's a lot of other things that can affect this, particularly if it's monitored live voice. And, 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 you know, 
the language of the listener and the familiarity of those words, that, that's another sort of issue too. Um, but, but the key variable that you're in control of that will skew uh, this result to a, to a poor result or will ensure that you're, you're doing it correctly, uh, doing it uh, uh, to the best possible level is presentation level and you're in charge of that. So in this case, you set the presentation level and then the measurement, the metric of the test is percent correct of the word list, all right? And it's percent correct at a particular uh, decibel value. Um, and so again, uh, that's like sort of this is like the, of all the tests we do in the basic test battery, there are decibels, this one's in percent correct. And again, and the best we can say is like percent correct of these particular materials. Um, as I mentioned to you last time, um, for any of these kinds of materials, how well a person understands the word, meaning he's able to repeat them back to you correctly, um, varies as a function of presentation level relative to their threshold for speech to where it's, you know, let, let's just say where it's loud enough, whatever that may be. Um, and this is very predictable. So the, the, the curve here, if you will, we call this a performance intensity function. We have percent correct. Uh, over here on this axis, and you have the decibels uh, uh, over here, and it's basically saying for monosyllabic words, we have this gradual, per, you know, percent correct per dB uh, in, uh, improvement, and I don't know what that is. It's like what, you know, 30, I don't know, it looks like somewhere like, you know, maybe like 30 dB per decade of decibels, you know, once you get to about 10, 10 dB, uh, 10 dB HL, whatever this may be. Um, so it's a steady, it's a steady uh, growth of we say growth of, meaning score gets better, growth of, uh, of, of, of percent correct. Now, uh, for um, once you get to um, an amplitude that is an approximately 40 dB above the person's threshold for, uh, for uh, hearing, um, threshold for, uh, for speech, and on the assumption that the person has normal auditory function, that's what you're going to get. So that's the normal function, okay? for someone who does not have any hearing loss, okay? Now, <clears throat> principally, the, the contribution, if we look at the different parts of the auditory system, peripheral auditory system, and I guess like doing anything else, we start to think about, um, we'll have to assume on these tests that you know, we're not concerned with the central auditory system processing. And usually people who even come in with a complaint of central auditory problems, whatever those may be, their peripheral test results almost always will tend to be within normal limits. Not always, but tend to be. And I think, uh, and when you have your class with, with your instructor for that, you can ask the question, you know, how confounding is the dual, a dual presence of central auditory processing and peripheral hearing loss? And how, how, does, that, how does that work? My understanding growing up in audiology was that when you have peripheral hearing loss, it kind of makes it very difficult to interpret all of the central auditory processing tests. Now, I don't know if that's still true, or if any of these tests have been normed on people who now have, who have, have peripheral hearing loss, but that's, that's, a, that's, a future, that's a question for your year three. So two years from now, you'll be, you'll be revisiting these things, and you'll say, you'll have a distant memory of, we talked about that somewhere, and I can't remember. Um, all right, so. I already alluded, and we sh I showed you some data last time that that, uh, that presented some uh, data from the, that are presented in the book that look at the performance intensity curve as a function of the type of pathology that exists. So if we talk about it, how many different pathologies, not just discrete individual causes, but 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 um, do we have in the, in the peripheral auditory system? Three. Okay, what are they? Mixed sensory and oral interconnectors. Okay, uh, very close. It's a very close answer. Conductive, sensory, or like um, sensory, like in the cochlear and the retrocochlear. Okay, so yeah, so for me, for me it would be, uh, we have normal, if there's a conductive component, if it's cochlear, and if it's neural. Okay, because remember, sensory neural means, strictly speaking, you got a problem, and you know, we have a problem that we can't rule out because it doesn't definitively say you got this and you got this. What it means is sensory neural is we can't rule out the problem that there's a problem in the cochlea or along the auditory nerve pathway. Could be in both. 
it's really a weaselly word. Weaselly, it's not a good word. It's a, it's a weak word. It's not a strong word at all. But it's a word that's very commonly used. It's a lazy word. To be more specific, though, people would get nervous. If we started saying this is a hearing, these results are consistent with cochlear dysfunction, I think that would make a lot of people go, whoa, whoa, slow down there. But we, that's a little strong, okay? Uh, so it's, it's, that's just how the community of the convention is, so, so to speak. But um, uh, to Nadalai's point, if it's retrocochlear, meaning if it's neural, uh, and, and the preferred probable language if we're talking about findings is, is to say retrocochlear as opposed to it's the neural of sensory neural, uh, but that's what it is. It's the neural of sensory neural. Uh, but retrocochlear, that's a big flag. That's a big like, well, we got a problem. Potentially. So those different, you know, depending on what part of the auditory system is affected, is going to affect what that curve looks like. Okay? So what does this, I, I really would love to draw on this right on here, but I can't do that. Um, we should have a big plastic sh sheet that I can drop in here. Uh, what's this curve look like for conductive hearing loss? If you had to draw it right now, just on a scratch paper, what would it look like? What does it look like? Conductive. Um, when you just kind of shift it over to the right, so you have to make it louder for it to be perceived. And then, so, all right, so, so they have a hearing loss, yeah. so their basic level of where they start to hear it isn't going to be a 10, but it's going to be, oh, let's say they have a 30 dB conductive component, 10 points, so they start here. And then similar shape, but probably... Identical similar. shape. Yeah. Identical shape, identical curve, and... and and so you're going to have that again, that gradual uh, rise in, in uh, intelligibility or in percent correct scores, and then this asymptote at 100% correct if it's purely conductive. Because with conductive, whether it's outer ear, middle ear, the source of it, doesn't decide if it doesn't matter. And what we're talking about is simply a reduction in the amplitude getting to the cochlea. And, and, and so there's really, that's all that, uh, you know, it's an important part, but that's all that it does. Now, when we start talking about cochlea, it can be anything. When we start talking about retrocochlear, it can be anything. And, you know, even when you think about retrocochlear, but isn't that really kind of a problem? Isn't that a major medical problem? Yeah, it is. Most, but most retrocochlear disorders are progressive. And so what they look like depends on when you're looking at them in their uh, pathogenesis. Okay? So given that, um, the literature for word recognition testing for the most common retrocochlear pathology that we will, most common medically treatable retrocochlear pathology that we see, which would be vestibular schwannoma, also known as acoustic neuroma, uh, okay, which again, as we said, is a non-cancerous growth of the uh, myelin-producing cells in the peripheral nervous system that are around the, uh, the eighth nerve, okay? so. Um, so each, each neuron is going to have multiple myelin segments on it. That's going to be, uh, again, the myelin uh, allows for fast transduction of electrical signals without, um, you know, correctly spaced myelin with gaps. Uh, you don't get the fast transduction, uh, you know, transmission of signals uh, uh, along, an, along a nerve pathway. So it's really, really kind of important. But these cells kind of go, go wild for, you know, a variety of reasons and they get hypertrophic, um, typically in the internal auditory canal. Um, so the problem is, is that is at what point are you, are you assessing that? So early, early in their, in, their, in their pathogenesis, you may get 100% word recognition and still get a radiographically confirmed presence of a vestibular schwannoma acoustic neuroma. So you might end up, you might have a test that a person comes in and has like, you know, it's complaining of unilateral tinnitus, um, you know, it's probably in their you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, and that age range. Uh, their hearing may be fine, their word recognition may be fine, um, and maybe you're going to go ahead and then do, um, uh, for example, uh, acoustic reflexes, what we'll be talking about in the next couple weeks, and their acoustic reflex pattern is going to be off. Or we talked about that test earlier in this thing about uh, tone decay test, that uh, you know, abnormal adaptation where the person's not able to hold on to the signal. And, and maintain audibility of it, even with the constant amplitude signal. It's just they, their nerve can't keep up with it over over time, over a minute. Um, so there may be there may be some clinical evidence of this, but yet on word recognition tests, it's going to be 100. percent 
So, um, and, then, and, the, and then the person goes and gets a, an MRI, and the physician's going to come back to you and say, hey, how come there were, I learned in, as a resident in ENT that, were, that you know, that, that there should be poor word recognition here. Are you, you know, are you, are you doing the test, you know, they may challenge you on it, and you say, well, small tumor, intracanalicular, okay? So, you know, you, you probably barely see it on the imaging, you know, so at this point, you know, if we monitor them and we see them in the next six months, a year, that score is going to go down, very likely. We're not saying, well, we hope it does, so like it shows that I'm right, but, but, that's, that, but that's the point, is that uh, if it's a really small tumor, uh, it's not going to be affecting uh, the, the system maybe at, you know, quite at that point. But there may be other manifestations that you might see. Um, and so again, for, um, for retrocochlear, we showed you the pattern in which they may be shifted, yeah, by the amount of hearing loss that they may have. They're going to do well at some point, probably not 100%, and then at higher amplitudes, their score is going to get poorer. And we call that the fact that you've got a good score and then it gets better. We call that rollover because the curve is rolling over. That's, that's, that's uh, I, I don't know who made up the word, Carhartt, I think, maybe was one of the original ones. Carhartt, one of the students, Doug Knopfsinger. Knopfsinger had been the chief of the VA audiology at West LA. Um, and I got to know him a little bit. I worked with VA. Uh, interestingly, Dr. Peterson and I both worked at the same VA uh, outpatient uh, clinic in Los Angeles. It was at 4th and Hill Street. But we weren't there at the same time. I was there before him. Um, so I was there for a couple, of four, four or five years. Then I left, and then he came in maybe a year or so later. So it's just kind of weird. It's weird. That's how it was. Um, uh, that we had that same work experience. So uh, Nofsinger was a chief at the, at the West LA uh, VA, and we were in an outpatient clinic downtown. LA. Anyway, um, so yeah, so uh, with cochlear loss, we would expect that, yeah, maybe it's gonna be shifted by the amount, you know, by, you know, where, by the amount of hearing loss that they may have. We would expect that they're not gonna get 100%. Could they? Yeah, they could, you know, and it really depends. Um, some disorders, uh, that you'll talk about in medical, uh, for example, Meniere's disease, Meniere's syndrome, Meniere's, uh, uh, syndrome uh, also known as endolymphatic hydrops, uh, is a, um, a disease which has, uh, uh, it gets poorer, gets better. So depending on, you know, by implication, uh, the amount of, of excess endolymph that's built up inside the scale of media the more, the more endolymph that's, that's accumulating in the scale of media, the more compression there is on structures in the, in the, in the scale of media, on, or, on the organ accordion. <clears throat> and because it's kind of mass loading, it tends to have a, a, a greater effect on lower frequency. So you'll see a low frequency unilateral sensory hearing loss, usually with poor word recognition. Well, that condition is going to get better on its own, and the person might come back in, and you'll test them when they're not in a, in a hydropic attack of, uh, that Meniere's usually appears, and their score will be great. So it just depends on when you're testing that patient. Uh, but typically, we would expect that the asymptote would, would, not, would not approximate, you know, would not get quite to normal. But we're not gonna see it, we're not gonna see it fall off either. So with cochlear, uh, you know, what the evidence that we have would be that you know, if you're not sure and you're getting like a score of you know whatever it is, 76% correct, you know, and you want to go up 10, 15 dB to check for rollover, you know, that's that's probably okay, probably a good idea. All right. So, you know, and again, you're never going to be plotting all these data points, but these curves need to be in your head. You need to be having an understanding of okay, I'm here. I've got a person now. Here's the data point I've got right there. You know, I've got a 76% at whatever this is, 65 dB uh, presentation uh, level. Okay, is it possible that that data point there could be, does it really represent what we're trying to find out? And on this test, we're trying to find out, and what we report is, what's their best possible score? It's up to us to test the person under whatever combination of conditions are required to get the highest possible percent correct score for that individual. As I said to you, the most common variable that you're going to have control over is going to be presentation level. But there's some other things too. But presentation level is, is one of them. 
Um, and so again, how, how would we know? And so, you know, we'll have to kind of apply some analysis to that and see. And so then if, if you know, you may be satisfied with the 76% score here based on whatever your presentation level, you just figure logically it couldn't really be any better. But again, you know, is it possible that, you know, you might think counterintuitively, is it possible it could be worse? And again, you have to kind of think about, well, what are the conditions that, you know, that would likely this person has, you know, a retrocochlear involvement. Um, again, the, the complication is that um, older folks, presbycusic folks, who have an, uh, a primarily neural component to their presbycusis are going to likely have rollover also, but they'll have it bilaterally. And so if that's the case, that's really the only kind of condition in which we would say, you know, per, uh, someone who has bilateral retrocochlear signs uh, is like, you know, but, but it's symmetrical, bilateral symmetrical retrocochlear signs is likely not going to be uh, someone who has a bilateral symmetrical uh, vestibular schwannoma. That doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen that it would be bilateral and symmetrical. The only other condition in which somebody might have bilateral vestibular schwannoma um, would be a neurofibromatosis type 2, uh, which is um, neurofibromatosis type 2. Uh, in which a person has, uh, again, tumors growing of these, these kind of, uh, same kind of tumors growing on various uh, cranial nerves and even spinal nerves uh, as well. Uh, and you could have somebody who has an outcome of having two acoustic or vestibular schwannomas, but they're not going to be growing at the same rate at the same time. So one, you know, the one that happens first, then, you know, then it will be documented, might have treatment for that, and as the person comes through treatment on that one, then the other one might just start to grow in that and, and get uh, poorer as well. Um, might, it might happen on optic nerves, it might happen on other nerves uh, as well. Um, sometimes, and, and this happens typically to patients in maybe their second, third decade of life. So these are patients that you might encounter if you're at advanced medical sites because they may be getting treatment for debulking of those tumors. But this is a very, this is a horrific diagnosis to have. Because as these tumors grow inside your, your skull, they're growing in places where there's no space for them to grow to. Um, and so um, it's, it's very hard. Um, you know, young people will die because of this. It's, it's autosomal dominant, we'll talk about it. Uh, we'll do a presentation on it in next semester of genetics. But it's all autosomal dominant. Uh, which means that one parent had to have it or, that, or it's a fresh mutation. One problem with autosomal dominance is that they're also, you can have a fresh mutation, but you've got to figure out, is there something that caused that? But more often than not, autosomal dominant, if you go back in, across the generations, there should be somebody that had it until you find a founder effect. And then, and then each one, if it's passed on, there's a 50% chance that uh, each offspring might get it. Uh, and so a person may not have, may not know that they have it yet, and have their own offspring, and then get a diagnosis of NF2. It's awful. The other, the other conditions like this that, um, not doesn't affect the auditory system, but it's kind of similar in terms of this sort of, um, what's called reproductive fitness, is, uh, is Huntington's disease. And there's, there's plenty of, of videos and stories on, on the internet of people, um, now that they have a, they identified the gene for Huntington's disease, where people, who had an affected parent can get themselves tested to see whether they have this condition that's going to kill them. And so it talks, you know, so the stories are kind of dramatic in the sense of, do I want to find out if I'm going to die in the next 10 years? If you're, you know, a 28 year old, if you're a 30 year old, you know, if you have that particular gene uh, for that. Um, so there's some interesting, interesting uh, stories on, on that. Again, uh, not so much the. Uh, we see that with the NF2, but you'll, you'll see those patients. All right, so two basic tests that we do in this peripheral test battery. So when I say two basic tests in speech audiometry, I'm talking about the way that we typically do this basic test battery. And the caveat for both of these also is these are tests that are done, um, it's just, it said these are done in quiet. And what does that mean? In quiet means that you are not deliberately putting a noise into the signal, okay? Remember the audiometers that you're using, you have the capacity to mix noise and put noise in the other ear, and I'll bet you, you're not gonna think, why would I ever do this? You know, you could also put noise in the same ear, okay? Uh, and have that be as a, uh, as a disruption. Uh, and again, you might say, well, why would I wanna do that? Why would I wanna put 
Why would I want to mix speech and noise, meaning do a literally a speech in noise test? Um, uh, why would I want to do that? And, and there is a name for that, speech and noise test, sin, sin test. Um, and then there's also, and I think that's built, I think the speech and noise test is built into the audio, uh, the, the audio star pro. And I think there's also a shorter version of it, and I can't speak to it, which is called quicksend. So some of you might have been involved in quicksends in your past. I'm not sure. We don't need to talk about that so much. But, but the fact of the matter is that, that this is a test that, uh, at least according to Jay Hall, you read the Jay Hall article, he says that this is a test that we should be doing routinely to replace the monosyllabic word recognition and quiet. On face value, most patients are going to come to you and say, I have a problem, you know, what's your problem here? And I hear it okay, but, you know, I have difficulty hearing in the background of noise. And so, to Dr. Hall's point, this doesn't really help. I disagree with him mildly on it. It's, this, is still a ba- this is still a good solid baseline number, and we, it may not have as much value as we'd like it to have, but it still is a solid number. So I don't quite go completely in with him on that. Um, um, but uh, any of these, you know, speech and noise tests uh, manipulate the, the you're, you're manipulating now not just presentation level, but also the relationship of that to, to noise that's actually mixed in with the signal. The only other time, the only other time you're going to be doing uh, noise would, well, you tell me, uh, other than the quick sin and the sin test, which is different. That's a test that's looking at manipulating the, the person's ability to extract. Um, the words out of the background of noise in the same ear. And again, if you think about it, what did I say we're interested in in the word recognition test anyway? What did I say, what is, it, what is, what is the material that we're using, you know, aimed at finding? What is it that we're interested in, in their ability to do when we, re, when we read them words or have them listen to words on our monosyllabic word recognition test? Analysis. We're looking for their ability for their. We're looking to see how good their cochlea is at extracting frequency information. All right. And so, um, in the context of a background of noise, that kind of stresses that. And so that's that's what's sort of good about it is that some people are going to have you know better extraction of this material in a stressed condition, meaning in the background of noise where it's all mixed. Um, and so that that you know over the course of your careers, you know it'll be. Interesting for you to know whether or not 10, 15 years from now, you know, this test now is the test that we do and we don't do this monosyllabic word recognition in quiet because why? We're just going to do that. So that's something for you to keep your, your eyes on and, and be skilled at doing that uh, speech and noise test. But other than that, what's the only other time that you're going to be mixing noise into, a, into this test, into either of these tests? You're putting speech in one ear. What's what? When else? When else would noise be a factor? Masking. masking yeah, because for the same the same reasons that we have to put masking in for pure tone, we have to use masking for speech threshold. We have to put masking in if we're doing word word recognition. And you could think almost there's almost a, a greater need if there's if you're ever going to be doing um, these, you, you might have more of a need to be doing word recognition testing. Uh, with masking in the other ear, uh, probably more commonly, I would almost assert that because you're going to be seeing a lot of asymmetrical losses that are going to be asymmetrical sensory neural losses. And if that's the case, that's where you really kind of got to knock out that other ear to be sure it's not picking up signals, uh, that speech signals. You, the, the notion, though, is that you know, um, if you're using insert earphones and using speech, uh, as we'll see, the high... Uh, the, the components of, of the speech of the speech frequencies that really contribute to understanding are, are, are have the, the poorest inner attenuation anyway the, the, the lowest in amplitude of, in, in the for broadband of speech energy anyway um, so um, so the first thing that we have to kind of contemplate is that the um, your SRT which is the thresholds of your pure tone uh, pure tones that you're going to do um, is now going to be um, compared to the, the SRT test. Um, and so if we do a three frequency average, uh, we, the convention is that you're averaging 500, 1,000, and 2,000. Okay, and so as you read studies that look at this intensively, you might see it encoded like this, like 3F PTA. Um, the most common uh, issue for you 
that you're going to be dealing with in your lives as audiologists is that you're going to have someone who's going to have an audiometric configuration that we would say is a sloping configuration, which means that they have poor high frequency hearing. If that's the case, a three frequency average is not going to agree with your SRT. Your SRT is going to reflect the person's better hearing, which for those, for the majority of those patients with sloping configuration is going to be based on their thresholds at 500 and 1,000. So in this case, you're going to have to do a two frequency pure tone average. All right. Um, the other uh, issue that I had pointed out when we had talked before is that it's also possible that you might have um, a person who has an island of hearing somewhere, in which case their SRT might be based on their ability to hear on that island of hearing. So their, their audiometric configuration, uh, you know, might be something like, like that. And so, you know, this might be some frequencies we would not normally test, you know, you know 1500 to 800 hertz, something we wouldn't get, we wouldn't go there. You know, we, again, that's the problem with the audiogram is we're doing data sampling of how many possible frequencies that can a human hear. I don't know, 20 hertz to 15,000 hertz. You know, we have the capacity with our machines, with our audiometers to test out to 16,000 hertz. Why would we want to do it? Principally, if we're doing checking on, uh, you know, pharmacological, we're checking for um, if there's um, any uh, hearing loss due to ototoxicity that might be part of medicine. So it's just, an, you know, we're, are we actually checking at the frequencies, you know, at all frequencies? No, we're testing at discrete frequencies that are an octave apart, and what if the, you know, what if we're just not catching it? You know, what if we're not, we're not getting it? Um, and so uh, if that's the case, then uh, you have to be suspicious and think, well, wait a minute, this person is absolutely reliable on their SRT, and so let's look around and let's hunt around for where there might be and so start looking at some interactive frequencies to see if there's, some, if there's sensitivity there that could explain it. It may happen rarely in your career, but again, my job, my job is, a, is to make you look good when you're out there. That's my job. And so it may only happen once or twice in your career, but you can say, I'm ready for this. I came prepared for this audiogram. I was you could say to the patient, you talk over it. I was expecting you. I was expecting to see you at some point. I just didn't know it was going to be today, um, but you will see them. Uh, so again, um, SRT, I think we're, we're sort of done with the SRT. Uh, we talked about the, the fact that um, it, we may do with children more than anything, you know, speech awareness levels. Again, you have to be uh, careful, some people, about calling it speech uh, detection level or, or threshold. Threshold to me always implies that you've met some statistical criteria. All right, and, and, and so that's, that, but that's more of a pediatric issue, so I'll defer to Margaret uh, on that. Um, again, if we had a summary uh, of the, the characteristics of SRT, this uh, speech recognition test for, uh, uh, that's a threshold level test. So it's a threshold level test. We use uh, equally stressed bisyllabic words. Um, and again, um, the notion is that these are words that are familiarized. The procedure actually says that they're familiarized, reviewed in advance. Uh, or you're making the assumption that these are words that are in this person's vocabulary. Uh, we use spondees because they have a sharp growth function. So unlike the, 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 the monosyllabic word uh, function, we saw it as this gradual 10, 15 dB rise per decade uh, of, de of decibels. And monosyllabic words is maybe one or two dB. And it's gonna give you, it's gonna go from you know, zero to 100% over five dB or whatever it may be. And so therefore, the, the words choice, the choice of using monosyllabic, uh, using spondees, kind of uh, keeps us grounded to uh, very little variability. Um, whereas the other words are gonna be all over the place. Um, so that sharp growth function is, is, you know, spondees chosen for that test is a real important aspect of that. Uh, we report this in DBHL, uh, the response is they repeat a word and again, we use it uh, basically a closed set of words. And the problems with this is, is what procedure do you use? Um, the procedure that's advocated by ASHA right now is ASHA 1988. I remember when it came out, and a guy named Richard Wilson did it. Richard Wilson was at the VA in Long Beach. So back in the day, the Southern California was just hopping with like audiology stuff. So Richard Wilson was one of the few um, audiologists in the VA who had a, a VA government classification as scientist, okay? And, and so Richard Wilson was very well published. There's another article that, that we're gonna quote at the very end here that he did with one of our, 
one of our Cal State LA colleagues here, a guy that was here for a few years, uh, Ted Bell. Um, and so um, uh, Wilson, not surprised, if I had to ask you where did Wilson get his doctorate, who wants to guess? Northwestern, Northwestern yeah. You know, so who was his professor? Carhartt, yeah. Okay, uh, I mentioned to you also Doug Knopfsinger, you know, with uh, looking at uh, where did he go to school? Northwestern, Northwestern yeah. Who was his professor? Okay, Carhartt, you know, so all that stuff. Um, and so, yeah, so there was a, a real, you know, uh, those, uh, those folks, uh, men and women alike, you know, they really kind of controlled, uh, control audiology. Um, and uh, for a long, long time. And so Jerger, Carhartt, um, the guy who was at um, UCLA and ran the auditory test uh, center, auditory test, I forget what it's called, auditory research center at UCLA for 30, 35 years. It's a guy named Don Dirks. Don Dirks um, hired Ted Bell, who was who, had, who worked for Dirks until Dirks retired, and then Bell came here. And uh, Ted Bell uh, was a uh, experimental psychologist interested in the auditory system. He was at Cal State LA for maybe 15 years, um, and um, was the chair of our department for a little bit. He was chair of psychology for a little bit. Not not a clinical audiologist, but interested in the auditory system. So Dirks, uh, <clears throat> Dirks and I had something in common. He got his master's degree in audiology at the University of Kansas. Okay, well, okay, you, yay. Uh, and then uh, with, and his professor was a guy I told you about, uh, Neil Getzinger, right? I told you about Getzinger. And so Getzinger, who was Getzinger's professor? Carr. All right, so when Dirks finished with his master's degree at Kansas, what did Neil Getzinger tell him to do? Go to Northwestern. Go to Northwestern. So he did. And so then, so then Dirks went to Northwestern and so on. And so then, um, so uh, Dirks, uh, when he retired then, that basically the UCLA, we, he, he did great work at UCLA, wonderful work. Um, and I got to know him a little bit when he was here. And he sort of liked me because um, we had this kind of Kansas connection. We both had Neil Getzinger as a professor and stuff like that. So that was kind of nice, uh, interesting, sort of, yeah, interesting, nice guy. Um, so anyway, um, with all of this, um, all this stuff going on, the procedure that's advocated right now is one done by Richard Wilson, getting back to Richard Wilson. And he's a scientist uh, kind of fella, and, uh, as, and not a clinician. And, and his procedure, I, I don't want to, I doubt, you know, I, I would really love to know when you get out in your externships, if somebody says, we do the ASHA 1988 Wilson procedure for SRT. I would like to know that, because I want to know what person is actually doing that, because what he does is basically does a descending procedure and then subtracts eight and then adds one. I mean, it's like got all of these mechanical steps that are statistical corrections for variability, and uh, and it's just like you know, I, I never you know it just it just was to me it was just antithetical to me as working as a clinician, and and, and whether Wilson um, kind of understood that or not. He was just trying to find the procedure that was had the best, you know, had, had the least variability and so on. But if you look at it, and I'm sure your textbook probably talks about that procedure, and you might say, well, geez, you know, we're doing the ASHA procedure for pure tone thresholds. Why aren't we doing the ASHA procedure for spondate threshold uh, determination? And, I, you know, I it just, I, I can just say, just for me, it was just too much to have to remember as a clinician. So, but take a look at it, and if it's something you like, and again, I, I'd really like to know if anybody's actually doing it. Um, so what procedure to use? So again, likely for, there's as many SRT procedures as there are audiologists, okay? Um, and so I've always modeled, I've always on face value said, okay, this threshold procedure is like the pure tone threshold procedure. So I'm gonna use one of the original, sort of the original, and there was about multiple variations of it, but ways to kind of mimic what we do in pure tone threshold. So doing an ascending, descending kind of thing. Uh, and there were some things that were kind of time wasters on it. So in other words, when we drop down, if, in other words, we're, if we're trying to find a 50% uh, a dB value, the least amount of decibels that a person responds 50% of the time, if you want to make a direct analog to this test to, word, to a pure tone testing, because that's, that's the threshold criteria. So, so what do we do in that procedure? At some point, they respond, then we drop down 10. So then on the SRT procedure, you know, if in order to get a 50% response rate, you have to use a, a, a trial set of something that's divisible by two, you know, by two. So you have to use 
four words or whatever, so as a minimal set. So that's where the, you know, the criticism of it was, okay, you got a response you know, at whatever, at 20. Now it says uh, you know, uh, where they're hearing it at 100% response rate, so you know that's not threshold, you drop down 10 and you have to present four, and if they don't hear any of them there, that's a, like a waste of time. Now you ascend five, just like you would do on a pure tone, and, and now you give them, again, four uh, words, and then if they get how many, you mark how many, if they get you know, two out of four, okay, you, then you're supposed to drop down again, and then ascend. But there's a couple of those down tens that you're presenting four words, and you're just kind of going, airplane, cowboy, hot dog, air. you know, it's just like, okay, a five, okay, now, now, we're, now we're back in the zone where they should be able to hear it. And again, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna use the analog of the pure tone threshold test, then you, you only count ascending responses. You know, or, or you start at null, and then you come up and you present words until they get it, and then at that point, then you drop down 10, and then you do your bracketing again around wherever you, you believe that, that result is. So I'm going to bet that most of the people you're going to work with are going to do some variation of this threshold test, and you're going to do some kind of bracketing in around where the threshold is going to, where it's expected it's going to be, you know. Um, and it's just the timing of it and, you know, where you enter into the test procedure, again, it's going to probably depend across the different sites that you're at. Um, and, and, and again, where you have it in, in your test procedure. Now, if you do the audiogram first, which is going to be likely, remember uh, uh, the likely thing that most people are going to have you do is the audiogram first. So you'll have your pure tone average at that point. So at that point, uh, or you'll have at least what frequencies there are, uh, and so that might dictate where your starting point is. So if you, get a, if you have your pure tone, your two frequency, or your three frequency pure tone average is 30, well, maybe you're going to start presenting words to them at 35. Say, okay, these words are going to be really, really soft. So much like pure tone thresholds, you have to say here, um, same thing, you're going to be listening for, for words that are going to be really, really soft. And even if you hear part of the word, I want you to say whatever it is that you, that you hear. Um, and so, since they're familiarized, that's going to help them kind of guess uh, a little bit at what words they're, they're hearing um, and so on. Um, and so again, um, you know, I, I, I can't say how many pr procedures that you're going to do. Uh, you, you know, take a look at the, the chapter on this and, and they, they review a couple of the, the ones that are sort of classic ways to do it. But fundamentally, that's what you're going to be doing is you're going to be doing some kind of bracketing around the threshold. And again, the thing is, how do you come up with a 50% response rate? And so you just have to have like, you know, four words, or, you know, two out of four, you know, uh, to be able to say that's yes, 50% response rate. And the same kind of criteria are going to be, what if you get three out of, if you get three out of four, it's better than 50%, so that's probably a point where I would not count that as SRT, I'd want to go down from there. If the, but what if you get one out of three or something like that? Much like you're doing on pure tones. Okay, well, it's going to depend. Um, on, on your own response uh, criteria. Uh, so uh, the, hum, the hum, homogeneity issue, uh, I gave you the, the Rourke Cullen article from Central Michigan that has those kind of listed out. Uh, standard test materials, uh, again, we're assuming that they've been familiarized or they're part of their vocabulary. Uh, and again, if you do this test and you use a, des a, a descending uh, approach to, to, to finding it, again, my bias is uh, I always want to limit high amplitude responses until I know I've got a valid responder. Um, so again, you know, starting off at 60 or 40 dB and, and saying a word and dropping down until I get it, I don't, I don't do that. I would want to have the best guess about where they are, you know, where they're likely going to come in and go 10 dB under it and then come up and have them you know, hear it out of silence. Okay? Um, so, uh, and, and again, giving them something really loud to hear initially, that's, you know, that to me that's, a, that's an issue. Uh, uh, providing what's called a loudness loudness reference or loudness anchor. Again, that's a testable uh, notion, and, and I've seen some tests, some some you know empirical work that says, well, no, that's not as strong as we think it is. So I don't know. So that's a doctoral investigative project right there too, is seeing whether or not you know, otherwise you know, normal hearing motivated uh, you know individuals you know can maintain a loudness anchor or a loudness judgment of something that's so loud. Okay, I want to remember that because I don't want to respond above that. The other thing that you might get, by the way, uh, on this, uh, I'm not sure how much more I have on this, okay, uh, on, on this is that um, the other, the other pop-up kind of uh, uh, inconsistency that you'll see, uh, if, if you're doing familiarized words, so you, you read all the words to them, so you know what words there are, you didn't give them any other words, 
um, and you say, I'm going to say just these words to you, um, and they start saying other words, that's kind of goofy, you know? Uh, people who are um, trying to fake hearing loss, they don't know what it is sometimes that they're supposed to be hearing. So sometimes uh, you've got a pretty good idea where that SRT, SRT should be, for one reason or another, um, or maybe multiple reasons at that point. Uh, and then um, you know that it should be really like right at 20. Uh, and you're at 20 and the person's not responding at all. And so then at that point, you gotta kind of push them a little bit and maybe just you know softly re-instruct them. I say, okay, now you're gonna be hearing these words, remember, they're gonna be really, really soft. And I want you to respond, even if you hear part of the word, hear whatever it is that you hear. And that, the, by the way, I'd say the same thing for word recognition, monosyllabic word recognition testing. Because I wanna, you know, if they just say, you know, you're saying these words, you know, say the word thin, and they just go, I don't know. No, that's not good enough. I want to know what they're hearing. They're hearing something. They're hearing something. They've got to be hearing the vowel part of the word. And I want to know if they're getting that part correct. Because if they're not, then that's really, really bad. You know, so, so give me your best possible guess. And so sometimes people will play along or not. And, you know, it really depends on how poor their word recognition really is. And for some people who have really poor word recognition because of some significant cochlear or neural problem, it's a frustrating task for them. So just say, okay, just say what it sounds like to you. And then if they're like kind of snotty back, I'll, you know, say the word thin, they'll go, Ugh. you know, <laughs> say the word dog, Ugh. okay, I, get, I see what you're doing there, fellow. I see, I, I see what you're doing, okay? You're not, you're not happy on, on this test, and you're not participating and giving me whatever phonemic information that you're receiving because you don't feel as valuable I do. So that's me not selling the test best, better, as best I could. So, um, but here's what happens to somebody who's malingering. Somebody's malingering, you've read them the words, and you're going to say, you know, these are the words we're using here, you know, airplane, cowboy, hot dog, ice cream, toothbrush, cowboy, whatever. Um, and you know they should be hearing it. You know, you know based on whatever the data, whatever observation, they should be hearing it at 20 dB. And, and so they, they don't, they're not responding at 20 dB. And you go with your uh, voice over, again, as low as possible, maybe, you know, 30, 40 dB uh, on, uh, on the talk over. Say, hey, you're not, you're not really hearing, you're not really responding to some of those words. And so just, even if it's really soft, even if you're part of it, uh, and, and so they might go, oh, okay, yeah, 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 I was hearing some of it, but I wasn't sure what, what I was supposed to say. And so you go back in and you say, you know, you know say the word ice cream, and they go, ice something. <laughs> so it's like, okay, good, thank, okay, thanks, that's good, that's what I want you to do. You know, and, or, you know, cowboy, um, something boy. Well, it's like, okay, so you, you can't say back to them what you want to say is, like, dude, I gave you the words, it's ice cream, it's cowboy, and you know, your memory, you don't have a memory deficit so poor that you're not doing that. You're just, you're just joking around with me, but you can't say that, but you know that's it. So if I say the words ice cream, and I give it to them as a familiarized word, and they say ice, and I'm not sure, ice something. Okay, thank you, I just move on. That's, to me, that's, that's, a, that's a response, and you note that the patient responded with half word responses. And that's going to be sort of, again, a classic part of somebody who's malingering, because they don't know what it is that they're supposed to be getting wrong. Another reason why we find them somewhat contemptuous, because they haven't done their homework. Okay, I don't mind, you know, people are, you know, if it's a fair fight, then they've got to be, you know, coming in prepared. Much like you, come prepared for class every day. You know, so it's like, you know, it's that kind of pre preparation, they don't do it. Um, so anyway, so that, that's, you know, it's one of the hooks that you would see uh, for that. All right, so we talk about um, monosyllabic word recognition test. Um, the point here is to find this result in percent correct. Now, unlike the word recognition for spondaic thresholds, the, the spondaic threshold, you can infer the audiometric results from that. This, this number you can't really get. Because I'll tell you that we could get, I could get three people with identical audiograms. And this may happen to you at some point. I had one morning where I, had, I tested three people. They were all like 70, I mean, it was like a magical moment. And I, and I should have really had gotten copies of their audiograms. And it was three, like, identical audiograms. And you can think I'm making this up. And I'm not. I'm really not. Or if I am, it's really, it's, it's good. But you can at least accept it's theoretically possible. But it really did happen to me. Where they, they had three 75-year-olds come in. They had the same basic slope of hearing loss. Where their hearing was good through about 1,000 hertz and then it dropped off. Uh, Three very different word recognition scores, three very different sets of complaints and issues that they had, very, three very different sets of what they wanted to do and were willing to do 
based on uh, what my recommendations were, which was hearing aid amplification for all three. Um, so it's really hard to infer, in some cases, what that number is going to be, particularly with older people, because you got to remember the cause of their hearing loss is is itself multifactorial. So it could be cochlear, could be mechanical, could be vestibular, uh, not vestibular, vascular, could be neural. And so depending on what is worse in an old person is going to really make that, frankly, why is it so variable. Other people, it's just going to depend on where they are in terms of their progression of their hearing loss and so on. Um, so in, to some extent, we can, we can make a, a, a ballpark guess uh, about what the person's you know, hearing ability you know, on, hearing, uh, on this test would be. So what I want to do is just kind of pass this out to you. I don't think I passed this out to you, right? This is in the, this is in the slide set. So when I said we can, we can kind of, you should have a, a ballpark idea about what's going on. So this is now, um, I don't know if I have the article for you here or not, but this is um, material on what's called uh, the uh, uh, Speech Intelligibility Index, or the SII, uh, which in older days was called the um, uh, articulation function. So, let me put this up here. All right, so, um, so Killian and Muller. So, um, Muller is, um, I'm sure uh, Muller has chapters in your. Uh, Ricketts book, yeah? You don't, know, you don't bother to see the authors of this stuff you made. <laughs> but uh, but Muller is, uh, uh, is a guy that's been in, uh, around the audiology and, uh, you know, for a while. Killian was an engineer. Killian brought us, um, in addition to hearing aid, um, sort of uh, uh, amplifier and, and receiver uh, speaker uh, advances, uh, also was the guy principally behind the uh, insert earphone. So Killian is a very, you know, very well-respected electrical engineer um, uh, for uh, was for Knowles Electronics. Knowles Electronics is in Chicago. So guess what audiology program Knowles Electronics endorsed or worked very closely with Northwestern. So there you go. Um, so uh, in this context, we're looking at um, uh, this. I wrote over this. This is all my writing on this. So. The SII, or Speech Intelligibility Index, count the dots audiogram form. So what we're trying to do here is, what you're seeing here is in DBHL, you're seeing, if you were to draw an ellipsis around these dots, you're seeing what's called the long-term average speech spectrum, uh, if you will. And so, uh, but it's in HL, so it's, it's different than if we looked at it in SPL. If you looked at the same thing in SPL and just looked at the... Um, yeah, I, I just I misspoke briefly. This is not this is not the long we can get a sense of the long term average speech spectrum here, but uh, in, in one of the, the the two handouts I gave you, um, I do I do show it to you. So the long term average uh, speech spectrum in DBSPL, um, you know, it looks like that. So most of the energy most of the energy of speech. Is sort of centered around 750 hertz in that in that range. So so and you can see that you've got this tail off of amplitude in the higher frequencies. Okay. So take a look at the other. I, I, it's called principles of speech perception or something. But the other accompanying um, PowerPoint slides that you have here. So long-term average speech spectrum is telling us that most of the energy of speech is occurring in the low frequencies. That's what the long-term uh, average speech spectrum is. Um, so you'll see this is LTASS, long-term average speech spectrum. Uh, and you can see that what, where it is, where most of the energy is, low frequency, where it's skewed, where you see the roll-off. You can see that in principle, that between um, the most, uh, the highest amplitude sounds to the, to the least amplitude sounds is about 30 dB. So that if we think about it, of, the, of all the phonemes that we use, at least in English, and English is a reasonable uh, Analog for other other languages, phonemic systems, because we've appropriated multiple languages. So, um, 
So I doubt that there's any, any language that has anything that's much lower in frequency or much higher in frequency, generally said. So that means that across the words that we might say, there's going to be a 30 dB difference from phoneme to phoneme. Okay? So if someone's going to det detect the word, J basically they would probably need to hear all the phonemic elements, but some of them are always going to be higher in amplitude than others. Um, and by the way, uh, if you guys are, are looking at how much spread of masking? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you have? Yeah. So, one of the, one of the issues, and uh, one of the issues that, I, and I, I've never had a, uh, a spirited discussion with Dr. Asagi about this, and, and she's the messenger, really. She's not really the, you know, she's just reporting what's in the literature. But um, if you had this English word, author, author, someone who writes a book, this vowel here, is that right in phoneme? Is that, is that what the B? Anybody knows IPA? Who's done descriptive, descriptive phonetics? Is that right? I don't know what the What? The IPA. This? Beta? Oh, beta. Okay. I don't know what oh, you're going to be like the Yeah. Well, that's what the IPA symbol is. Yeah. No, yeah. the metal is great, but I don't know what that's called. Huh? <laughs> what, what's your, so what's your IPA symbol for, th for voiceless no, that's the age? Not this thing. No, yeah, it feels correct. Oh, you want it like that? Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. All right. So I've got, okay. <laughs> Diagonal or what? No. no. The middle oh. thing? Middle? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Now you better? Okay. This is this is my Halloween mm. favorite. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, author. There should be a 30 dB difference from that vowel to the TH. So how much does it take to well how much how much dB value has to be for upper spread master? In theory, the aw to the TH is 30 dB more intense. But yet, when we hear the word, we hear it in word context, you can hear author. But author, author, that's 30 dB. That's the, the biggest dynamic range that we have in sounds is that vowel. That's an East Coast vowel. So probably not, you guys don't produce this. Uh, you produce it as, uh, as this, this one. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't know how you do that. Author. Ah. Uh, yeah. That's say, ah. Uh, that's Western. <laughs> I think yeah, we still say it author. Author? Ah? Uh, author. Uh, author. Uh, author. Uh, author. Uh, so like a, uh, uh, so just basically. Author. Uh, uh, author. Uh, yeah. uh, author. Uh, and I say all, oh, because I'm a dog from New York. So dogs, <laughs> I should have been a cadaver dog. <laughs> if I had a choice. Coffee and talking with dogs. Um, so, but point being is that, uh, uh, is that it's, it's, it's hard to explain to speech perception eyes, how come there's not upper spread masking? How do we hear that TH if that's a 30 dB antecedent event? Shouldn't it be, you know? Anyway, side issue, and I don't mean to make you argumentative, but it is illustrative of the fact that there is a change in amplitude across the phonemes that we typically use, and that's the broadest extreme. Um, so what the SII is, Something that we're going to talk about next class. But real quickly, what the SII is, is, is a weighted mathematical scheme for assigning how much each frequency region contributes to the ability to understand speech. So this is really the underpinnings of audibility, not recognition. But, but here's the thing. We went through our levels of speech perception. If you can't hear it, it's going to be unlikely you're going to be able to understand it or to repeat it back if you didn't hear it in the first place. So the face value of having this audibility here is what it's showing us is that for, for, for words and for speech, each dot here counts one, one point toward a total of 100 possible points of the speech ii. So it's not necessarily if you have a you know if you have an 80 uh, point, a score of 80 on the SII you're going to get an 80 percent word recognition score it may not be um, exactly that kind of correlation 
Um, but it should be reduced because you get, you're going to be missing some phonemic elements, but it's going to depend on what the, how you're assessing it, what other information the person has, so there's many other things that are part of that. Um, and so look to the, uh, the, the, the principles of speech communication slide set that I have, because I gave you multiple examples in that of how the audiogram intersects it. Fundamentally, the audiogram is only going to be valuable to people from a counseling point of view if you have this on there. Because now you can actually see what sounds are audible to them and what's not. So you, the main point here is that if you have a slightly sloping hearing loss, they're missing everything that is in their inaudible region. Remember, the audiogram divides that person's range of sensitivity into inaudible, audible. So anything that's inaudible, they're not getting. And so, again, even a mild hearing loss uh, that might look like it is going to have a severe loss of audibility for the most important sounds. I just chunked them up into bands so you could have a quick idea of, of, of what bands there are you know, in these particular frequency regions to assert my point that this middle frequency of 2000 hertz is you know, plus or minus an octave is the most critical region for, for speech intelligibility, for the ability to understand speech. And so therefore, many of the decisions that I would make clinically are predicated on what's happening in this 2000 hertz region. All right, sorry to keep you a moment late. Um, today's Taco Tuesday, by the way, 